først uh, må jeg bede om yrsægter, for jeg er faktisk blevet bedt om at tale på engelsk. Det er åbenbart uh, lidt vanskeligt at forstå mit danske her i Gødeborg. Så so, uh, with that introduction, I'll start in English. So first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I think it is so fantastic and cool uh, to come back and be part of this evaluation. And I know that, that you are all sort of saying, oh, but we could do more and we need to discuss more, we need to uh, evaluate more, we need to have a greater dialogue and all of that. And, and yes, I think you're right, you can always do more of that. But I think you should actually also uh, be a little bit proud in Gothenburg about your process. Because what you are doing First of all, with the international workshop, afterwards with the engagement process of all the citizens in the city, and now this continued evaluation and discussion in the Elbrumet and in this group uh, and in on, 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 on different medias, that process is actually what is internationally recognized now outside of Gothenburg and outside of Sweden and Scandinavia. So the world is looking to you uh, because of this fantastic process. So keep that open, keep that going. Yesterday I talked about this paradigm shift of planning. And it is really a planning uh, paradigm shift that we are in. Uh, we heard from Björn this old philosophy of the modernistic, uh, modernistic pla pla planning paradigm, which was all about systems and thinking about the city as a machine. Uh, and we have left that paradigm. And we are now in the 21st century discussing how to make complex cities work, how to make those cities work in a fine grain integrated network. And that requires so much of all of us because we don't have the right solutions. There is not one single person in this room who can stand up and say, I have all the solutions, I know what to do. Not a single one of us. So it's only by collaborative uh, process that we can actually go forward and discuss what are the indicators of a good city? How should we engage people? What are the tools? Do we in fact have the right planning, uh, planning process and the, the right planning uh, tools? Um, what does a new uh, local area plan content? How do we work in this dynamic framework as Hannah was talking about in the Freehamnen and so forth? What is it that we need to fix now in order to be dynamic and open for the future developments? We don't know but we are finding out as we move ahead. And that's why this uh, day today is so important, to continue to discuss what does it mean to build a livable city? What does it take in terms of organizational power, decision-making, political leadership, architectural courage, and so forth? We as architects, we think often that we can design all these solutions. But it's not only about design. It's also about these other softer values that we are talking about now. And essentially the softer values in terms of how do we create a society which is engaging, considering trust, democracy, and so forth. We've seen this starting point uh, in many of the presentations especially around Freehamnen, the central uh, station area, Guldbergs Vass, all of these areas that are today over uh, exaggerated with the, this dinosaur type of infrastructure. But it's also a fantastic potential. And I really, really love coming back to Gothenburg um, in, in this process because there is so many qualities here that you should be proud of. And you should actually uh, tap each other on the shoulder and, and be proud of those potentials that you have. The industrial heritage, the international outlook, the openness, and the courage. 
And what is important now in this process is to, to leave some of those systems thinking that we have had at the time and really put people in the center of this planning. So how do we uh, resolve the infrastructure pieces and how do we then create these meeting places and spaces? So instead of developing uh, infrastructure, we should develop space. Space between the buildings, space within buildings. And together, buildings and spaces, we create a dynamic place of Gothenburg in the future. So I'm not going to talk about the sort of traditional Giel f uh, philosophy and the Giel uh, sort of uh, standard lecture today, because you all know about it. You know about the urban quality. You know about the, the, the people perspective. What I'm going to talk about today is um, I've, I've thought a little bit about the, the, the process and this model of urban development that was created. So that's going to be the, the sort of key focus of my talk today. And I hope that I can end this talk with a, a few sort of open-ended questions that we can then debate throughout the afternoon. I think in terms of this, uh, this model, um, as you can see, there is a lot of different aspects within this model that doesn't necessarily only uh, deal with the design of the city. First of all, it's about having a vision, which is in the center of this. When we started this process uh, four or five years back, I remember that I said to uh, Bo Aronson, who was, uh, you're sitting here in the middle, Bo, um, I said to you, Bo, uh, when we started this process, I, I did a few interviews and I was uh, asked to be part of this advisory board uh, for the visioning process. And for a vision to be strong, we need political leaders that owns that vision. And I said to Bo, we have a problem. There is too much of a gap of historic reasons, of cultural reasons in Gothenburg between the political leaders and the city. And the politi po politicians don't necessarily understand that the city as a physical form can help them realize some of their policies and politics and dreams, whether it's being health, better education, um, better mobility and so forth. And we debated, you know, oh, is that really true and so forth. And then we invited all the politicians in, uh, in the, in the, for the international workshop, and nobody showed up. Nobody showed up. And I think that was really when Bo and the rest of us in the project uh, team realized, shit, there is a major gap here. We are no longer there. I think we have, we have left that period. That was a dark period in my term, in terms of this connectiveness between politician and city. I think the city has moved on because there is a greater understanding. We have a vision document which has been adopted by the council, but it's fragile and we need to constantly develop that connectivity, and we are not close enough yet. The first, of our, the first thing that has to uh, be live is the sense of urgency. It's not about these fantastic growth plans that we've just seen. Um, it's not, that's not why we're doing it. We constantly need to ask ourselves, why are we doing it? Why do we find ourselves in this particular situation, in this particular point of time in history? We're doing it because of climate change. We're doing it because the city is in a situation where social, uh, um, social segregation is too big. And there is a eco new economic paradigm. We need to find new workplaces and types of work for the future. Those are some of the drivers of change. And then, of course, we have some project changes, Westlang and Utah Bridge, which has to come down, and, and the positive aspiration of a jubilee. But the very sort of core sense of urgencies and drivers, I would question, did everybody buy it? Or do we really still what can we do to keep that sense, sense of urgency alive? 
from Copenhagen and from outside. I question this because of the election in September. Did we get everybody with us in this process? And if not, how can we keep this sense of urgency alive throughout all of the discussions? A shared vision. We actually came out with a shared vision uh, of this two-year process. Fantastic. And it was bought. But to me, it's important to understand again, a vision is not a document. It's not something that we can just finalize, tick, now we have a document. A vision is a live process. And now we have to implement it, exactly as we've seen today with all the projects that are starting up. And the vision has to be a live element of all of those um, ongoing projects moving forward. Again, uh, one could ask, uh, are we there yet? It seems as if all the sub-projects are considering the, wish, the, the vision. But who is in charge of the overarching idea? The prioritizing between the different sub-projects. The coordination of these. Are we completely aligned yet? Or where are we in this process of all the arrows pointing in different directions and then all the points, or all of them pointing in one? That's uh, a question for us in the afternoon. So leaving the vision and talking a little bit about the leadership. Leadership is extremely important when one have to leave the status of visioning and entering the status of implementation. And leadership is not just political leadership, it's about how we organize ourselves. And this is exactly what is happening right now in the city, as we heard today, the project leaders uh, from, uh, from uh, Elfstrand Utvikling collaborating with the project leaders of the city, the organization being put into place. And this is going to enable this. But we need to think about that we are moving in a new, in, in a new direction. Earlier you could say that on a regulating uh, sort of uh, federal level, we were um, we were thinking about policies in the, in the past. Now we have to think about enabling. How do we enable change? How do we enable this facilitating? And the municipalities are, mo are moving away from being myndighed or approving body to becoming facilitators of change. And that's a totally different role from earlier. Do we have the right skills? Do the city actually have the skills to facilitate such huge project? Do we have the project management skills to implement big projects? I know the city is trying to, as best as they can, to hire new people in, hire new leaders, hire project management skills and so forth in, uh, from organizations like Trafikwerket and other places. But this is huge. And this is where you guys can support the city. You can challenge all, the, all you want with professional challenges. Is it the right architecture? How do we make active ground floors and all of that? But, when, but don't challenge too much when it comes to this fragile moment in time where the city is building up capacity. Support, help. You, some of you in this room, have those project management skills. And this is exactly what the city re needs right now, to have support from all of you in this aspect. The responsibility for urban planning is something that we have, until now, dealt with in different silos. Transport planning, strategic local planning, traffic maintenance, social health, property works. We all have these different silos within the city. But actually, dealing with urban development is about this shared responsibility. We have to leave the era of silos and work together in new types of project organizations across these silos. I'm going to show you a little bit of an example of how that is being organized in Copenhagen at the moment. But who's in charge? When we still have the old silo infrastructure, but we really need to work across the silos, who is then really in charge? And that's why it's important with these project leadership groups that we heard about earlier, 
and the steering group of all the directors of all the different uh, uh, organizations within the city, and especially how those Knekfolga that we saw in some of those uh, project teams, how those Knekfolga are taken all the way up to political level and decision making. Participation, similar as today, is extremely important. We are leaving the era of planning understood as power over. And we are entering the world of the new paradigm, which is all about power with. So how can we do that even more? How, we can, how can we keep that up? Have we, in, in fact, lost a little bit of momentum? It was fantastic, the days of the international workshop. We had so many people coming into the town hall. Uh, there were lots of talks throughout the city. And I know that some of that is continuing in Elvormel and here. Um, but can we do more? And how do we, in fact, keep engaging everyone? Not just us as professionals, but what is it that we need to do in the city to engage people so that we don't end up in the type of election situation of September. It's not just us, but we need to be out there in the city, testing out things, engaging people one-to-one, -one, real time, real life. And that leads to, this, to, to the next bubble in this engine of urban development, which is all about cooperation. And cooperation and partnerships between all these owners that we talked about and heard about in the projects, it's about collaboration and it's about collective impact. And again, that types into this change that I was talking about, changing roles. In the old paradigm, in the traditional role, the cities were more reactive. We got projects in from developers, we permitted building applications, we, uh, we built things and we evaluated. And in that old paradigm, the goal was good projects, best projects, best practice, and so forth. But in the new paradigm, we're proactive, we're collaborating, we are creating partnerships between all these different foundations, business sector, public sector, individuals, civic society, associations, sports clubs, and so forth all of these people that make up the city. And, the, and the, the goal in that situation is shared value. How can everybody get something out of it? How can we have a triple line uh, goal or triple line effect of everything that comes out of this process? Not just in terms of nice environmental buildings, but life quality and a good economic engine for the region. Are we closing these gaps? I think the city of Gothenburg and you guys are doing a, an incredible uh, positive work in this, in this, uh, in this uh, field of collaboration. But maybe we can do even, even more. An area such as the central station area, I think we need to build a partnership organization. The city is now running around to all, uh, a lot of different stakeholders in that area but there is not one partnership that has taken responsibility to build a fantastic new urban center around the station area. And that is just one area and one example. So we will see more partnerships in the future. We will see new multi-headed uh, development organizations that are ready to implement these projects. Holistic. What do we mean with holistic? In my view, I think it's all about life and form and how these come together. And this is something that we've talked about for ages, uh, almost <laughs> hundreds of years. The tale of two, si two, two cities of Charles Dickens uh, from the 8th, uh, 19th century talked about how the cities were being broken into different social groups. Jan Giel started in the 60s talking about the life between buildings and how we bring life and form together. And I would still say that there is so much we don't know yet about this connectiveness between life and form. So the more we can have it as our focus, the better.
And the city is representing a new welfare society as well. I think the welfare systems of Scandinavia is also a little bit fragile. And we can see it now with not just the political situation in Gothenburg, but the political situation in Sweden and in Denmark for that matter. Politicians discussing what is the welfare society and what's the welfare city 2.0. How do we build a city that's about a sense of community, solidarity, democracy, inclusion, trust, equality, flexibility, respect for nature. Those are core Scandinavian values that we have to almost write into every brief because we lose it otherwise. So we are leaving this uh, uniform type society that used to be there in Scandinavia. And we are entering a society of diversity. And I think diversity has a fantastic um, um, chance or a possibility. Diversity can be both locally here in Gothenburg and globally a value that we subscribe to and put into every brief that we develop for those areas. So again, how does holistic urban development look like? Holistic. It doesn't mean uniform. It doesn't mean that the architecture should be alike. It doesn't necessarily mean either that, um, that, that, uh, that everything has to be um, sort of um, uh, uniform in, in, a, in an urban sense. It's not only about the infrastructure, but it's, it's, it's about what Hannah talked about, the affordability of these new places. How do we build for everyone in society? And then learning. This is a learning uh, situation, uh, but it's also about building in this process into our, into our design of the city. And again, I think this is where we need to do more. And the fact that we are at Chalmers today, I think is really, really positive. We need researchers, we need PhDs, we need this type of testing, measure, measuring and refine type attitude to this process. We need people making public life studies out there in the city. We need to look at the things that are already being built to measure how is it working? Are we in fact creating the life that we would like to see? And that type of learning process should be built in uh, to, uh, to, to this process. And the university is a huge part of that. Are we thinking about using the city as a testing ground? I think not only Ringeøen should be this testing ground where we are allowing for organic growth. I think we should think about the city as a, uh, the, the city as a whole as this testing ground and organic uh, element. So just on that, a few examples. And uh, this is not because Copenhagen is any better than Gothenburg. We have our mistakes too, as we heard about from Björn with the Ørestad and other new developments. Uh, it's just because I know Copenhagen very well. Um, and then I've also included a few slides from New York. Copenhagen is in here because I think Copenhagen is an example of strong process and strong organization. Um, we have started this development and focus on public realm many, many years ago. So we have practiced since the 60s on these integrated design solutions. So you can say that Copenhagen in this front, in terms of public realm, is decades ahead of Gothenburg. You have great parks, but you don't have that many great urban spaces. So there is a lot to do still in Gothenburg. And sometimes we forget that Copenhagen used to be here as well. Copenhagen was a very trafficated environment back in the 60s. But today, that has been turned around through infrastructure investments in metro building, bicycle infrastructure, pedestrian infrastructure, and so forth. And we have 80,000 people walking in, an, in our downtown area, which is almost at the sort of, it's two thirds of how many people are walking in, in London, even though London is seven, eight times bigger than Copenhagen. Our squares used to look like this. 
and today we have nice public life uh, and a whole other sort of dynamic type of city. The town hall square used to be more or less a traffic roundabout, similar to maybe what you see around uh, the central station here. And that, was, uh, that traffic was, was, was realigned uh, and we, we had the opportunity to create this wonderful meeting place in the middle of the city, which can be used to everything from putting up the Christmas tree to having political discussions and demonstrations. So this focus over a 30-year period on public spaces, improvement of the urban quality, putting in different types of infrastructure and so forth, has changed the economy of the city. In the 80s, Copenhagen was almost bankrupt. People are sort of, uh, uh, or broke you could say, people moved out of the city in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and nobody lived in Copenhagen when we came to the end of the 80s. So through these investments since 88 and then all the way up to now has changed the demographic of the city. Today, Copenhagen has lots of families, lots of young people that are choosing to stay in the city. They don't move to the suburbs. They choose to live in the city. They have a smaller flat, but they have access to lively urban spaces, playgrounds, parks, and so forth. So we have a baby boom, you could almost say, in the city. And you see those kids. They're not just inside in kindergartens and in buildings. They are actually out and about in the city using these public spaces with the kindergarten pedagogues on the backs of their uh, parents' bicycles and so forth. So they are being brought up, kids are being brought up in Copen today as urban citizens, which is again fundamentally changing the culture of the city compared to when I was a child in the 70s. So we have an urban life in Copenhagen that we didn't have in the 60s. We have festivals, we have jazz festival, we have, uh, we have distortion that, uh, where more than 100,000 young uh, kids are raving the streets uh, and, and so forth. And this is the type of dynamic culture that you guys here in Gothenburg at the moment are developing. I can feel the dif difference from just five years ago uh, when I came to Gothenburg first and then to the type of life that I see popping up in Gothenburg now. So if the city could lower the barriers so that it's easier to apply for, um, for putting up an event, uh, different groups to engage in these temporary activities, I think Gothenburg has a, a great potential in front of you in, in that regard. And then this whole seasonal thing is something that we need to, to consider in Scandinavian cities, life in cities is not just about summer and cafe -latic culture, it's about uh, activities all year round and how do we make that happen in a city like Gothenburg with that much wind and, and, and that great uh, and, and big spaces as you, as you have. What is important is that we don't only focus on, this, uh, on the city center, but this, this type of strategy focusing on the public spaces is filtering into the, the neighborhoods where people live. Um, so this is a normal street uh, in, in one of the Copenhagen neighborhoods, but it definitely did not look like this um, 10 or even 20 years ago. The neighborhood squares are coming alive as well. So slowly, the cold Scandinavians in Copenhagen are coming out of their buildings and enjoying collective urban uh, spaces with their, with their fellow citizens. In the 60s, people were saying, no, Copenhageners, they sit at home, they have dinners with each other, candle lights, they don't sit outside, that's what they do in Italy. But that's not the fact anymore. This type of dynamic urban life is now filtering through everywhere. So city urban development is not just about form, it's about how we facilitate this change of lifestyle and change of urban culture. And another example is the harbor front, um, which I think is a particular good case in terms of federal level in Denmark, working together with municipal level to look at how to clean up the waters and, um, and after a 30 year period of cleaning out dealing with stormwater management and all of these different things, we now have a situation where we can finally 
swim in that harbor in the middle of the city. Um, this was the first swimming facility that came in, but we now have four or five different swimming facilities. And it is fantastic uh, because you can now, as a person living in the downtown area or in the city, se city of Copenhagen with, the, with two kids, this is amazing because you don't only get access to the water, you embrace the water and you are active. It's no longer the Dead Sea uh, running through Copenhagen, it's an active space. And again, it's coming out to the neighborhoods in terms of flea markets, little things that are happening and so forth. A major thing that has changed is the, mob the mobility flow of the city um, by actually putting in bicycle infrastructure, taking out two to, two to three percent of parking every year, supplementing it with metro, buses, bicycle infrastructure. We now have more than 35 percent of everybody in the greater Copenhagen area bicycling on an everyday basis, more than 50 percent of the Copenhageners. 55% in the inner city. And people are continuing bicycling at winter time. And this is uh, because the system allows them to do so. And I don't think we are braver or more hard uh, skinned or more Vikings than you are here in, in Gothenburg. This is only because the system is designed in a way so that people naturally choose what is good for them and good for the environment because it's the quickest, the easiest, and the healthiest choice. Rather than taking your car, spending time in traffic, having to think about where, where should I park the car? Oh gosh, then I also have to pay a lot to park it somewhere um, and, and so forth. All this sort of hassle and bustling of, of having to deal with the car in the city center, a lot of people choose not to. And they walk and they bicycle instead. So cyclists, pedestrians, those are the people that are making cities lively because we, we get people in the streets. And we now have a situation where cyclists have overgrown the number of cars in the inner city. Who would ever have thought about that when we started in the 70s? All of this is, is, is possible because Copenhagen, they do not have master plans, but they have a vision. And this is what you now have in Gothenburg. You have a vision. You don't know necessarily how it's going to look, but you have a shared vision. In Copenhagen, that vision is called Metropol for people. They also have a plan, which is about um, putting in the extra 12,000 people a year in the city, growing the city, densifying the city, at the same time lowering the emissions. And the target is a zero two uh, uh, um, emission or zero uh, CO2 emissions by 2025, which is a, a really, really difficult goal, but it's there. So Copenhagen is good at setting targets. We have targets like this. We have targets on how many people should bicycle. We have targets on mobility split. We have targets on, we have social targets as well. And maybe that's also where Gothenburg could be taking that the next step. Now you have the vision, but you need to set some targets and you need to measure how you get to those targets in every project you deliver. And then it's about organization. Copenhagen has ever since the, the 80s started integrating the line organizations of the municipality. In the 80s, they started merging what was the transport department with the parks department, similar to what, uh, what Malmö has done. But now, throughout many merchants of, uh, and versions of uh, organizational change in Copenhagen, they're taking it to the next step. This is happening now, 2014. They are completely abolishing the line organization. No transport department. No, uh, no uh, department for, 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 for parks. They are abolishing the park, the, the, the line organization, and they are making four main areas of the city. One, which is about Byens Drift, the management of the city. So everything that deals with the management of the city is in that, in that area. Byens Physik, meaning the development. How are we planning? How are we developing the city? The third one is about the Byens Udvikling, 
uh, which is about the strategies. Where are we heading? The economic growth and plan and so forth. And the last one, Byens Anvendelse, which is all about life. It's about um, how we actually use the city. So this is a completely different way of thinking about how to organize a city. No longer this way, but it's about this way. And it's about understanding if I was a citizen or if I was Trafikwerke, I don't care whether I need to run to the traffic department to get this approval, and then I need to run to this parks department to get another approval, and then I need to run to a third department to get a third approval, and so forth. I don't care. I just want the city to take care of it. So rather than organizing things in this way, it's being organized in a horizontal way. And this requires a lot from a city like Copenhagen, even though it is already in integrated and we used to have departments for urban design and all of this, this is super challenging uh, to throw away these old silos and work in new process and project oriented ways. Copenhagen today is a city at eye level, I would say, because of this development. And Gothenburg can be that too. A city where people are visible in the streets, not cars. New York, as an example, is in here because of strong leadership. Copenhagen has had many, many different leaders throughout these years. And I wouldn't say that there has been a particularly strong leader um, we've had this framework and made it work over this long process of time. But New York has had an incredible strong leadership. It's also a more top-down version, you could almost say. But they started out with a sense of urgency. They started out with a plan, with a framework and a vision, which was, was all about, if we don't do something now, the city will die because of climate change, because of densification, because of segregation, because of economic change, and so forth. So they really set out this sense of urgency. Something needed to be done. The streets were choked with traffic. We couldn't put in a single more uh, person or car in that, in that existing infrastructure system. So the city was choked in traffic. So how to deal with it? Um, we started working with the city back in 2007 on this. The plan, the vision document came out in 2006 after May Mayor Bloomberg's uh, first period in office. Um, and we started working on this. What, um, I'm not gonna show you the whole, the whole framework and plan and so forth, but just a single piece, which was about the pilot projects, which became a, a really, really uh, important way of engaging people in the city. So even this, even though New York was handling this change in a very sort of top-down version, strong leadership, um, then uh, they actually did something important, which was about piloting temporary things, using the city as a test bed, measuring out different things. Um, and with very little money, they started changing the, the geography of the city. And also, uh, as shown later, the culture. So these are just some before and after images so that you can have a sense of the type of change that was happening. And this was not a nicely granite design, all the rest of it. This was just purely, you could say, colored asphalt or colored tarmac and different geometry within the space. Times Square before and after. And when we started talking about these things, the traffic engineers said, this will never work. You can never change traffic in the city of New York. We have X number of thousands of uh, uh, cross lights and uh, bulbs and, 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 and uh, the, the traffic system will collapse. But in fact, um, it didn't. And we were able to, over the course of a summer, uh, two to six months, uh, together with the city uh, of New York, measure the effects of those changes. We would never, uh, and the city would never, have gotten a political approval for these things up front. But actually, through the piloting process, showing uh, what the reaction was, how people reacted to it, uh, getting the numbers right, showing that actually there was a better ease of traffic in the area, um, less pedestrian injured, um, and, and um, 
uh, an increased uh, traffic flow even uh, on, on 17 percent. And then 74 percent saying that this has dramatically improved the area. N not because of landscape design, obviously, uh, because, um, but, but because people were attracted to people. People felt they had a safer environment. So I think maybe I would challenge Gothenburg to do more of those types of, of, of piloting projects in the city and to engage you as an uh, architecture community in these types of rethinking, reimagining uh, the, the urban realm. And New York also has created, throughout this 10, 12 year period, they've created fantastic park projects as well. Hudson River Park, Brooklyn Park, um, fantastic projects where you can get a distance uh, and you can see great skylines and you can get access uh, to, uh, to, to playgrounds, not necessarily all the way down to access to the water, but just access closeness to the water so that you understand the grandness of those places and spaces. So, so summing up uh, towards the end here, um, life quality in our Scandinavian cities has a lot to do with how we design the city and had, has a lot to do with how we mix uses in buildings and how we design spaces. We need to understand this refocusing on life. And we as architects, we need to leave the old paradigm of only thinking buildings and really, really concentrate on this life and culture. Because if we are not, we are losing out. I can be a little bit afraid, even of today, it was a fantastic presentation this morning, uh, with all the projects, but they're still quite high up in the helicopter. How are those projects going to land? How are we going to create this life between the buildings? How do we ensure that we help the municipality and the builders in, this, in, this, in these areas to get all the way down to the ground floor and understand what is life going to be like in these spaces and between those buildings? That's going to be our number one uh, target that we are constantly measuring the projects up against. So the question is, what's the, what's the uh, biggest strengths um, and what's our biggest challenges today? I think this process that you have started is admirable for other cities. I think the engagement and participation project uh, process, you're doing really well. And you should just continue doing that, more of that. But what is in fact the biggest threats? Maybe that's something that we should discuss in this afternoon uh, panel. Is it the lack of sense, uh, sense of urgency, as I started with? Is it the fact that we haven't quite come into that playing field of the vision and game yet? Is it the fact that the many different projects that we've seen today are not totally coordinated yet, or we don't have the organization in place? Is the biggest threat that we are lacking competences, project management skills, implementation skills? Because this is, this is what the, this stage is about. It's about implementing the vision. Those are kind of open-ended questions. You guys know better than I because I'm coming from outside. You know where skoen trykker, as you would say in Danish. But co-creation is the way forward. Um, and it is very closely res related to our essence of Scandinavia, which is about citizenship. It's about understanding that everything that you and we contribute to the greater whole enables us to benefit as an individual. So take that responsibility. Don't just brag and say, oh, this is too bad and this is too bad. Be a part of it. Co-create. Take responsibility to create in Leven Oster. Thank you.
väldigt bra slutbild tycker jag. För det är precis den här uppmaningen som vi vill att alla vi som finns här inne och de vi känner och våra familjer ska liksom ta tag i. Och finns det att dela ut en bok? Ja, det också. Oh. Tack. Tack för Ernest. Mycket inspirerande och energigivande dragning tycker jag. För allt väldigt mycket. Power tillbaka. Man känner verkligen också, som vi sa här på morgonen, vilken fantastiskt rolig uppgift det här är. Alltså vad vi har framför oss. Och det är ju, vi, vi allihop blir ju bärare av detta. Att jag tänker att det här med att aktiv, aktivera medborgarna, att höja den allmänna medvetenheten, att höja ribban lite grann. Där är vi ju alla eh, ytterst delaktiga och eh, en, en, en vik, vi viktiga bärare av det, ska jag säga. Mm. Precis. Mm. Sen var det kul att få lite beröm också. Ja. Kände ni det? Ja. Ja. Visst, visst växer man lite grann att det håller på att hända något här i Göteborg ändå. Även om vi kan plocka vissa saker från Danmark och vissa saker från Oslo och andra städer. Men det håller på att hända något, eller? Mm. Ja. Och det beror ju på oss hur vi liksom tar den här liksom stafettpinnen vidare nu. Mm. Eh, ni har börjat diskutera lite grann här i grupperna. Och ni får jättegärna fortsätta umgås i grupperna och fortsätta disk- diskussioner kring den här lunchen som vi bjuder på nu. Och jag och Anders, vi kommer väl titta igenom lite av det här så att vi kan fånga upp någonting av det här till eftermiddagsdiskussion. Vi har ju också, det är ju flera föreläsare här nu och vi skulle gärna vilja att ni skulle kunna ställa lite frågor sen också. Men vi, vi har valt att lägga det ihop med den här diskussionen i slutet på dagen. Så ni kan ju anteckna era frågor och spara dem så ska vi kunna liksom fånga upp det också. Ja, vad ja, har vi då mer då? Precis, ja, men vi fortsätter diskussionen under lunchen och vi kommer att fortsätta att brottas med den här frågan under eftermiddagen också här, så att, men nu behöver vi vi har fått mental energi kan vi säga, och nu behöver vi kanske lite mer annan form av energi här då, så att ja. om vi återsamlas här om en timme. Kvart över va? Eller ska vi säga det? Ja, ja. kvart över ett. Kvart över ett här. <laughs>